Hey everyone, welcome back to Portal of Wisdom. I'm back today with another story for you. So if you are new to the channel, like and subscribe and click that little post notification bell so you get alerted when I post new videos. And now on to today's topic. Today we are going to do a historical story. It is on the Kensington Runestone. And if the Kensington Runestone is proof that the Norse were in Minnesota in the 1300s. So have you heard of the Kensington Runestone? If you haven't heard of the Kensington Runestone, you're not alone. There's a lot of people that haven't heard about it. But it is a gravestone-sized rock with Norse carvings on it, or runes, which was the carvings or the language of the Norse all the way back to, you know, Vikings. And this runestone was found in Kensington, Minnesota. So, hence the name, the Kensington Runestone. And some believe it proves that the Norse were here in the 1300s. So, there's a lot to this story, and there's support on both sides, the skeptics and the supporters. So, we're going to go over some of those details. As we go over those details, we'll get into kind of how it fits into the historical context of things. It's a very interesting story, so you really need to listen to the whole thing. This has gone on for quite some time. So, the story starts like this. In September of 1898... Olaf Oman, a Swedish immigrant farmer, and his sons, they were clearing trees on their homestead, which was near Kensington, Minnesota, and they were trying to turn this land into farmable land. So they were using a winch to pull down some of these trees, because some of these trees were said to be 25 to 30 years old, so not giant, but big enough. And apparently there were some neighbors also helping with this endeavor, and some of them bore witness to this event. And the event is this, as they had felled one of the trees, they found a large rock intertwined in the roots very tightly, and when examined, this rock had Scandinavian runes on it, or carved into it. And when word spread around about the find, most thought it was a hoax and thought it was created by Olaf. But the people that were on site that day, they swore that it was not a hoax and that they were there and they witnessed it. So this Kensington runestone, it is about 31 inches by 15 inches by 5.5 inches, and it's 202 pounds. So it's about the size of a gravestone, and it's pretty heavy. It's not something very easily, uh, you know, toted around. So at first, the stone was not able to be translated, not until 1907. So it was found in 1898, not translated till 1907. They didn't know for nearly 10 years what this inscription on this stone happened to say. Then it was discovered in 1907 or translated to say, we are eight Swedes and 20 Norwegians on an exploration journey from Vinland through the West. We have camped by a lake with two skerries, and skerries are small rocky islands. So we have camped by the lake with two skerries, one day's journey north from this stone. We were out and fished for one day. We came home and found ten of our men red with blood and dead. AVM, which is believed to mean Ave Maria, save us from evil. And then on the side panel, we had, we have 10 of our party by the sea to look after our ships. 14 days journey from this island, year 1362. So that was what the inscription said. The bulk of it on the front, that last little part was carved into the side of the stone. So at this point, People believed if the stone was legit, then history needed to be rewritten. And if it was a hoax, it was a very elaborate one at that. 
So nearly everyone sided on the side of it being a hoax at this point. So people believe that it was a hoax because the story didn't seem that plausible. Why would they stop and neatly carve a stone when their party had just been massacred? Also, if they had docked their ships in, say, Hudson Bay in present-day Canada, then it would be about 800 miles to their location. And that's a heck of a long ways to make it in 14 days. And I believe they said this because the Scandinavians were believed to be in parts of Upper Canada. So when Scandinavian rune experts chimed in, they said that the writing, the language, and the text were questionable. And they thought that there were too many discrepancies in form and vocabulary from other 14th century writings that they had examined. So once people heard the experts say this, they, they hopped on board and they believed that, yes, this is a hoax. So also the stone was not as worn as some people thought it should have been, although it had been buried in the soil for a supposed long amount of time. People also said, what are the odds that a Scandinavian immigrant would find a Scandinavian runestone in a supposed ancient Scandinavian runic language of his old country? So they thought it was beyond coincidence. And experts also said that there were no other known accounts of Scandinavian seafarers journeying to the New World around this time. They figured that there would be some kind of records in old Scandinavia somewhere that just weren't there about these possible voyages. So at this point, the world just said, hey, this is a hoax, and they left it at that. But on the other side... You had Olaf, and he had supporters, people that were there, and other people that, you know, knew him and his family and stuff. And those people swore that, especially the ones that were there when it was found, they swore that it was not a hoax, and they had witnessed this. So many of the supporters, they stated that Olaf sought no money, no monetary gain from this this finding of this stone, he sought no notoriety from the find or anything like that. He ended up selling it to a local museum for only $10, and uh, apparently, you know, it wasn't that important to him at that point. So he sells it to this local museum, and it still sits there today. So Olaf was also not a very educated man. With his little education, people said... How could he know old Scandinavian runic languages and no one around him had any clue that he had this extensive detailed knowledge? And they just didn't believe it. So also at the time that it was found in 1898, it couldn't even be translated. So if someone was so smart with these runic languages and created something like this, and it couldn't be translated for nearly 10 years, they said it definitely wouldn't have been Olaf as the creator. So it was noted at this point that the there had been Norse campsites that had also been found with specific style of holes that were hewn into rock that Vikings and Scandinavians had used to hold the moorings for their ships and boats. And these campsites and these mooring holes, they were found from Hudson Bay, Canada, all the way down to the furthest south one, I believe, was in Sauk Center, Minnesota, which happens to be just a handful of miles from the Kensington Runestone location. So also people stated that the Norse tools had been found around the area in Minnesota and various places. So people that supported Olaf did have some things like this that they said that, uh, you know, could have translated to this is not a hoax. Another curious fact that a lot of his supporters mentioned was that some of the local Mandan Native American tribe had blue eyes, 
when no other tribes around did. They also had knowledge of Christianity before history says that the Mandan people should have had any knowledge of Christ. So many people said that the reason this was was because some of these Norse explorers did not make it back to their ships and they were assimilated into the native Mandan populations and they taught the Mandans about Christ and Christianity and changed things a bit for them and they obviously settled down with some of the Mandan women and these Mandan women then bore some blue-eyed children, and this continued down for many generations. So this is what a lot of people believe, because there weren't any other Native American populations that had blue-eyed individuals, except the Mandans. And, and of course, the Mandans were in this area. So at some point in the early 1900s, Another expert runologist examined the runestone, and he called it a hoax, too. He said he didn't even recognize one of the runic characters. But in 1935, there was this rare runic character that was discovered in texts in Sweden. You know, the particular character that they were looking for. So the rune was proved to be legit. But how could Olaf have known about this rune that was on the Kensington runestone that no one knew about in 1898, and it wasn't discovered until 1935 over in Scandinavia? So people said there's, there's no way Olaf wouldn't have known about a believed non-existent runic character that wasn't discovered in these, uh, you know, Norwegian or um, Norse scripts or whatever until 1935. So, you know, you're talking 37 years later. So, anyhow, people said this was also some more proof that Olaf did not create this stone. But the story doesn't really end there. So the experts and scholars, they continued to call the Kensington runestone a hoax without much more thought to it. And they just left it at that. And the runestone sat in the museum for a hundred plus years. But in the year 2000, that museum decided that, you know, they wanted someone else to look at it. So no geologist had looked at the stone at this point, and the museum decided they would look up a expert geologist, and they found one in the area to take a look at it, and his name was Scott Walter. So when they reached Scott, they determined that you know, Scott didn't know anything about the Kensington runestone. He had never heard about it or anything like that, so he had no preconceived notions about it. Scott brought in one of his uh, colleagues, and this friend was there to assist him on the linguistic side because his friend was an expert in linguistics and Norse runes. So with the two of them, they would go over the, all the details of the stone. So Scott said that he would examine it and give his expert opinion and you know whether it was good or bad he would give his expert opinion and when Scott and his friend looked over the stone they pretty much agreed with the prior translation of the stone minus a couple of small misinterpretations they said and they said that they weren't just on a journey that they said that part was mistranslated. Um, the actual words that they used were land acquisition journey. So they were coming to the new world to look for new land. And some of the other things in there, they said they got the gist that these people that were on this voyage were Christians and Christianity had spread through Scandinavia in the 1100s, so this would make sense. The age of the Vikings was done, and this was now the age of the, you know, Christians and the explorers that were probably most likely descendants of the Vikings. And they believed from what they were reading and translating 
that they found some clues that they believe they were from the Baltic Sea area of Scandinavia or the southern part of Scandinavia. So now it was up to expert geologist Scott to examine the geologics of this stone, and the museum was hesitant to let him take any core samples. So he told them, well, the world thinks this is fake, so you really have nothing to lose. If I determine it's fake, then no big deal. The world already thinks it's fake. But if I determine that it could possibly be legit, then you have everything to gain. So the museum relented and they went ahead and let him take some core samples from the back of the stone and also from the side of the stone where the carvers had split the stone to make it more rectangular and make it more carvable at the time that they carved it. And I believe he took a core sample not from where the writing was on the side but from the side that was split. Um, probably a quite a few inches from the actual carving on the side. So he had two sets of core samples. An original core sample from the weathered stone and one from this split side of the stone that the carvers had split it to make it more rectangular to carve on. So as far as the geologics of the stone, he determined that it was glacial carried rock from about a hundred miles away or so and he was able to match the rock up so the glacier had picked up the rock and had gradually moved it south through the tens of thousands of years or whatever and eventually when the glaciers melted and disappeared it left the rock behind some 10,000 years ago and that's where the rock was when the people that were going to carve this stone found it. Now, whether the year was 1362 or not was up for debate at this point still. But as Scott looked over these core samples under electron microscope, he found that this rock had very unique biotite micas in it and spread throughout it. So if you don't know what mica is, mica is a very thin layered rock. It has these these very thin, weak layers that are stacked on top of each other, kind of like playing cards or like peeling the thin layers of an onion, very similar to that. And as they wear through time, these layers are shed. So they gradually weather and wear down until the surface of the rock has no more of these biotype micas. But if you drill into the rock, they're still in there. They're just worn away. From the surface. So as Scott examined the whole rock, the original part and the part that had been split to make it more rectangular, he found that there were none of these remaining biotype micas really anywhere on the surface of the rock. They were all gone. And they obviously had been there at one point and had been weathered and worn away on all surfaces. So at this point, Scott really wanted to know how long it took for these biotype micas to completely wear away and be expo exfoliated from the rock, from the surface above and below ground. And he had an idea. He thought he needed to do a gravestone study of similar gravestone rock, but he needed a similar climate and much older gravestones than Minnesota had to offer. And he found what he was looking for in the state of Maine. In Maine, many Revolutionary War age tombstones had a type of slate rock that was used. And they had the same type of biotite micas in them. And many of these tombstones were 200 years old or older. And he could also test the stones above and below grade so he could determine what the weathering was like from you know the air and, and uh, you know above grade and he could determine what was happening to these stones also below grade or below ground. So tombstones were ideal for this study he had mentioned. So he determined that it took about 200 years for these biotype micas to start to slough off of the stones. So he also knew when he examined the Kensington runestone that 
It had no more biotype micas left on any of its surfaces, including the sides that were split much later to shape the stone for more easy carving. So in other words, he could absolutely say that Olaf did not carve the stone as it had been sitting for the last hundred years protected in a museum just as it was found in 1898. So he could definitively say that in order for these biotite micas to be present or not present on the surface any longer, he could say that the stone had to be in the ground well over 200 years and quite possibly a quite a bit longer than that to exfoliate all of these biotype micas. So he said when he started this examination, it was to understand if it was a modern hoax or if it was legit. And he said those were pretty much the two options. And he said he proved it was not a modern hoax. So he said everything on the stone logically has to be legit and correct, including the 1362 date. And academics and scholars did not accept his findings as they said there were still some runes on the stone that did not fit the 1362 timeline in their eyes. And Scott told them that every one of them was wrong and they needed to look harder. And they thought there was no way all academics were all wrong and this one man was right. But Scott, the expert geologist, he told them that this was actually the case. They were all wrong. And he told them that you need to look harder. And they told him, you don't know anything about runes. And he had let them know, I don't need to know anything about runes because the rock told me its story and the geology says that it is authentic. And, of course, the geologist didn't like that, and he told them, hey, you're missing something here. And all of these runes are from 1362. So the academics, so this was kind of a back-and-forth thing for a while. Scott said the academics basically said they had scoured all of Scandinavia, and they had not found these missing runes or all of these runes in text together at the same time period. But remember earlier I told you that in the translation, Scott and his linguistic expert partner said that the voyagers were from the Baltic Sea area of Scandinavia? Well, Scott went searching there, and he ended up exploring the island of Gotland, which is in the Baltic Sea just south of Sweden, and guess what he found? On this island, he found 92 medieval churches, and these medieval churches dated back into the 1300s and even older. And they were run by Cistercian monks. The Cistercian monks are the creators of the Knights Templar in 1128. So anyhow, in a lot of these churches, there were lots of runic carvings from back in those days, including a lot of graves that were mortared in next to the altars or around the altars in a lot of these churches. And a lot of these graves inside these churches had dates on them and had been dated to the 1300s, or at least those were the ones he was especially looking for. And they all had runic characters on them. And he found the missing runic characters or the characters that put all of these same runic characters in the same time frame that were on this Kensington runestone. So before the skeptics said, well, some of this stuff is from the 1300s, some of this stuff is from the 1500s, or whatever the case happened to be, they claimed that this stuff wasn't all from the same time period, that it was a mix of different stuff. But at this point, Scott had proved that they were all used in text at this time, or at least they were used in text on the island of Gotland. So the scholars were dumbfounded that he was able to find this and prove that all of these characters and writings were from the 1300s. At least they were on the island of Gotland. And the the scholars and academics, they basically said, hey, we had searched all the lands of Scandinavia, but we hadn't really gotten to the islands yet, especially not Gotland. 
So, as they say on the X-Files, the proof is out there. Well, Scott Walter found the proof, but the history books don't really like it. They don't really want to acknowledge it. And if that means that they would have to do something about it and rewrite history, they would rather not do that. So they pretty much had the same attitude as the academics and the scholars that didn't want to go out and look. And it was easier for them to say it was a hoax and do nothing. The unfortunate thing about this for Olaf and his family, though, was that they were called scammers, they were shunned, they were ridiculed by the community, and two of Olaf's children ended up committing suicide due to all the ridicule and stress and the fact that they were not accepted in society anymore. So they never really escaped the curse of finding the Kensington runestone. So it's a really sad story for Olaf and his family. So that is the story of the Kensington runestone from 1362 that was found in Minnesota in 1898. What are your thoughts on the story? Let us know in the comments and like and subscribe if you like these kind of stories. Thanks for listening.